chapter 21, please. Numbers chapter 21. <clears throat> Amen. Pastor Nate and I yesterday had the privilege to travel a couple hours from here just during the day. We were back yesterday evening, but just during the day, and we're apart for the day session of our Arkansas hyphen retreat. If you're new to what hyphen means, it's our young adult ministry here in uh, Arkansas, and, um, and also locally here, Brother and Sister Newton head up our hyphen group here at New Life. Uh, but there were over a hundred young adults that gathered together. It was their largest attendance ever at this retreat. And there was such a powerful visitation of the Holy Ghost. And I'm going to tell you something. And this, um, well, I'll just say it. I've never been more encouraged about the future of the church than I am right now. Amen. We have such a wonderful, wonderful thing happening in the church right now. And that is the stability and the foundation of our elders coupled with the energy and the excitement of our younger folks. And when you get those things together, that produces powerful things. And I'm so, so thankful uh, for what God did in our hyphen retreat. And then our quizzers had a great weekend over in Fort Smith. Uh, they came back with trophies and medals and certificates and honors. God bless our quizzers. We appreciate them, the good work that the coaches are doing with our quiz team. Numbers 21 and verse number 4. Numbers, Old Testament book of Numbers, verse chapter 21 and verse number 4. Then they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea, children of Israel, to go around the land of Edom. And the soul of the people became very discouraged on the way. Now, you don't have to raise your hand, but have you ever been there before? You ever been trudging your way through life? And if truth be told, you're just discouraged along the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Now, I won't ask you if you identify with that statement. Here's what they said. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and our soul loathes this worthless bread. <laughs> Isn't it amazing that the Lord gives miraculous manna from heaven, and the people, after a while, say, Oh, I'm so sick and tired of the miracle. <laughs> Hello. I'm so tired of this miraculous provision. It said they loathed. Now, that's a good New King James word for hate. They hated it. They wanted something else. Six, so the Lord sent fiery serpents. Got to be careful when you get mad at God. The Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people. And many of the people of Israel died. Now, that's enough to get you worried right there. Some of y'all who don't like snakes, that, you want to take that verse out of the Bible. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. They finally came to their right mind. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. Now watch what the Lord had Moses do. The Lord said to Moses, verse 8, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. And it shall be that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and put it on a pole. And so it was, if a serpent had bitten anyone, when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. I just want to read those last few words of verse number 9. When he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. Amen. Amen. I want to preach a simple message on the cross of Jesus Christ. The cross of Christ. Let's pray. Let's ask the Lord to speak to our hearts right now. We need him today. Jesus, thank you for this wonderful service this morning. God, I'm so glad to be among fellow believers, people that love you, people that are worshiping you, people with, uh, with whom I have so much in common. Lord, we are just pilgrims on this journey, Lord. 
We're just strangers in a foreign land. And I thank you that you've given us a wonderful privilege to lift our voices and our hands to you today. And you've given us your word, and I'm thankful for that. So, Lord, right now as I preach, would you give me a clear voice, Lord? Would you let the Holy Ghost speak to every man, every woman, every member, every guest, Lord? And then would you also confirm your word preached through signs following the supernatural ministry of the Spirit? And I thank you for that and give you glory in Jesus' name. And everyone, would you say amen? Amen. Turn to someone and say, the cross of Christ. And then you may be seated. It adorns millions of church buildings this morning. It hangs as a jeweled ornament around the necks of many people across this globe today. When this word is preceded by the word red, it means help in times of crisis. When it is preceded by the word blue, it means health insurance and increasing premiums, I might add. This is a word and a figure that has led armies into battles for centuries. It is looked at by multiplied millions as a historical watershed moment. It is when sinless, pure, undefiled man took on the sin of the world. It is the event and the moment of not just a sacrifice, but the ultimate sacrifice. I'm preaching this morning on the cross of Jesus Christ because it is a true and pure symbol of Christianity. In fact, if people were to be asked from all persuasions and backgrounds, what does the cross mean? Almost without exception, regardless of what kind of religious background one possesses, they would say that's the symbol of Christianity. But it is also a paradox. The cross of Christ is a paradox because it was and has been throughout time considered to be the cruelest of execution methods. In many times it was done publicly to control people and to instill fear in a major way. So here is the question I will ask and pose to all of us this morning. Why is the cross so prevalent in Christianity? Why is it that one symbol on a Sunday morning so loudly screams to us of Christianity? And I believe it is simply because Jesus never lost sight of the cross. Jesus, though his life was brief, always had in his mind that the cross was his purpose. Can I tell you something that Jesus was a miracle worker? Yes, but he did not come to this earth to simply work miracles. He was the one that opened blind eyes and unstopped deaf ears. He could touch a leper and instantly that leprosy would vanish. He could walk up to a boy stretched out on a mat and raise him literally from the death. He could take Jairus' daughter and breathe life back into her in a matter of just a moment. And yet all of his miracle power resident inside of him was not why he came to this earth. Because from the very first few moments that he began to recognize his calling and purpose for walking on the earth, it was because he had a date with a cross. He had a destiny with a cross. He had a purpose that went far beyond miracle power. John Stott, who was a prolific theologian, he wrote a book in 1986 called The Cross of Christ, and he said this, the fact that a cross became the Christian symbol and that Christians stubbornly refused 
in spite of ridicule, to discard it in favor of something less offensive can have only one explanation. It means that the centrality of the cross originated in the mind of Jesus Himself. It was out of loyalty to him that his followers clung so doggedly to this sign. I have felt a stirring inside of me for several weeks now to make sure that ever so often I, as the senior pastor at this church, comes to this pulpit and reminds us of the centrality of the cross. I think it's important ever so often to rise up and lift a voice and say, if it wasn't for the cross, we wouldn't be here today. If it wasn't for Calvary, we wouldn't feel what we're feeling today. We would be of all men most miserable if we had hope only in this world. But because of the cross, because of the old rugged cross, I can stand here free. I can stand here whole. I can stand here forgiven. I can stand here healed. I can stand here with joy in my spirit because of the old rugged cross. Come on, I need need some folks to help me preach this morning. Jesus had it in his mind his entire life. So if the cross was in his mind, it ought to be in my mind. I'm going to cling to the cross today. I'm going to run to the cross today. Oh, I feel it in my spirit. If you're struggling with depression, bring it to the cross today. If you need healing in your body, don't try to muster up your own strength. Bring it to the cross. If you're bound by depression and sickness and sin and habits, come to the cross. I don't have a magic potion. I don't have a magic word for you to say. But what I do have is come to the cross. Bring it to the cross. Bring it to the cross. Hallelujah. Matthew 16 and 21, from that time, Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. Watch what happened when Jesus began to relate the the cross, the coming cross. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. Peter said, It's going too good for you to talk about the cross. This thing's really shaping up real good, Jesus. Far be it from you. You're the man. You're the Christ. You're the Messiah. Surely this isn't going to happen to you. Strike that from the record. Hey, it's not going to end up like that. And Jesus turned to Peter. Now just so you get the context of this, about four verses earlier, he said, Peter, flesh and blood hadn't revealed this to you, this great power of the name of Jesus and who I am, but my Father in heaven has revealed it to you. He's just come from a glorious revelation. And yet on the heels of that glorious revelation, he says, hey, it's not going to end bad for you, Jesus. And Jesus rebuked Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. Jesus wanted him to be sure. If there's going to be victory, there's got to be a cross first. If there's going to be victory beyond this world, there has to be a cross first. We can't miracle this up. We can't supernatural this up. We've got to go to the cross. Oh, I want to preach about the paradox of the church. 
When the enemy says, hey, just get happy all the time, the Lord says, let the joy of the Lord be in you because of the cross. See, what the enemy doesn't want is us to ever get to that cross. Because if we ever cling to that cross, we are not looking at our ability, but we are looking at the price that was paid. We are looking at the price that was paid. We're looking at the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. Praise God. We never can stray from the cross. Jesus rebuked Simon Peter because Peter refuted that Jesus' ultimate destination would include the suffering of the cross. Now, there are four types of crucifixions found in history. Many times we think of just one. Let me show you what they are. Let me show you in detail what they are. The first is called the crux simplex. It was when someone was crucified on a simple, upright beam or stake. The crux or the cross simplex in the Latin. The second was the crux commissa. It was a capital T-shaped structure. Some people called it the tau cross because of the Greek letter tau that the cross looks like. The third type was what was called the crux decusata. It was an X-shaped cross. It still served the purpose of public execution, but in an unusual way. And then the one that perhaps most of us are familiar with, the crux emissa. It was a lowercase T-shaped cross. And so regardless perhaps this morning of what type of wood or structure was built or constructed for a criminal to die on. That is not the point that I wish to prove today. But what I do wish to prove is this, because Jesus was crucified, because it happened, now hear me, it could have happened, I believe it was on this type of cross that you see here before you today. I believe that even traditionally and historically that is true. But here, don't, let's not go to war over that. Even if it was an upright stake, even if it was an X-shaped cross, the key was this, Jesus hung on a cross and died for you and he died for me. And the Old Testament said, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. That gives us a prophetic foreshadowing that there would come one that would hang on a tree someday. That would take upon him the curse that was designed for you and for me. I want to preach it simply. I want to preach it to some people that have heard this theme over and over again. You and I had a curse on us when we came out of our mother's womb. The psalmist said we were born in sin and we were shapen in iniquity. The, the curse of, of mankind was upon us. And so it was so important that somebody die. This is why Jesus couldn't think redemption. He had to act redemption. He couldn't just speak redemption. There had to be a price paid. Everybody say the cross of Christ. You see, the cross of Christ is powerful today, first of all, because it means that Jesus knows pain. Jesus knows pain. I won't go into the graphic detail that doctors have said Jesus underwent, but suffice it to say that the cross of Calvary was not a beautiful picture like you may see a painter paint. But the Bible says in the book of Isaiah that his visage or his his complexion, his look was so marred that people did not even recognize that it was Jesus of Nazareth. 
It was a horrific way to die. A cat of nine tails put upon his back. Hands and wrists impaled on that cross. Feet and ankle bones impaled upon that cross. A spear thrust into his side. It wasn't some pretty painting with a little bead of blood coming down. It was graphic. It was horrific. But what I do know is this. Jesus felt pain. And because Jesus felt pain, he's felt what you and I feel. We are not worshiping a Savior today that is separate from us in heaven. But he was tempted in all points like we were and yet without sin. We feel pain. He feels pain. We feel forsaken. He felt forsaken. He took our pain. Thank God for the cross. Thank God that he gave his life for us. He identifies with me. That's why Peter said in 1 Peter 2 and 23, who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. He himself bore our sins in his body, on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. Hear me. The cross of Christ was painful, but it was painful not just simply because it was an execution, but it was painful so we would know he knows what pain feels like. If you've been forsaken by loved ones, so has Jesus. If you've felt the pain of being alone, so has Jesus. He knows what we feel like. We identify with him and he identifies with us because of the cross of Christ. The cross of Christ also means that sin's penalty has been satisfied. Hear me? My sin was great, but his sacrifice was greater. Now you're going to have to take a time out with me right now. Because I can think back on a whole lot of sin in my life that was great. But his sacrifice was greater than my sin. Come on, the cross of Calvary didn't wash my sins white as pink. It washed them white as snow. The cross of Calvary didn't just dab over my sins. It took care of the penalty. It washed me white as snow. It paid the judgment that was hanging over my head. My sin was great. But his sacrifice was greater. Oh, I want to preach it to somebody that's addicted today. You might feel like that addiction is strong, but his cross is stronger. You might feel like your your path is, is weary, but his cross is stronger. His grace is sufficient. His mercy is everlasting. His cross is greater. That's why Paul said to the Corinthians in the first chapter of his first letter, verse 7, for Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross should be made of none effect. You see, the preaching of the cross is not something that you get fancy with. You just preach the cross. But here's what Paul said in the rest of that 18th verse, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us, which are saved, it is the power of God. 
See, saved people understand how personal that one day was to us. Saved people understand how personal that one execution was. Saved people who have been washed by that blood, sanctified by that blood, set apart by that blood. Saved people understand how powerful that cross is. Because that cross is power, satisfied sin's penalty. There is no sin that the cross is not greater than. There is no healing needed that the cross has not purchased. There's no sickness that Calvary can't heal. There is no pit that Calvary can't pick us up out of today. In the Gospel of John chapter 3 in verse 14, it is an unusual passage And yet it brings us back to our text that we read in the book of Numbers. Numbers chapter 21 seems so different than anything in the New Testament. It just seems strange that the Lord would set serpents loose in the camp and start biting people and they're dying. It's horrific. I can't imagine that. And yet the Lord said to Moses, this is what's so awesome about the Bible. The Bible, forgive this 80s reference, is a cool book. Because we're back in the first you know, few pages of the Bible. And the Lord is saying to Moses, if people have a problem with the snakes, just craft some snake on a pole. Now just use your imagination here. Brother Nate, can you help me with this? I'll let you hold the base of this here. How many preachers does it take to unscrew a... I'm getting my workout today. How are we doing? We doing good? Yeah. Okay, Moses, here's what I want you to do. I want you to craft. I want you to get some of those artisans to craft a serpent, make it bronze. And I want you to put it on a pole. And all those people in that camp that are crying out, Hey, help me, Moses. These snake bites are killing me. Moses, get your serpent, craft it on a pole, and just get out there where everybody possible can see it. And all I want you to do is hold it up. Okay, God, I'll do that. What, what's that about? Here's going to be the remedy. Everybody that's been bitten by those serpents, you have the same opportunity. If you got to crawl, crawl out of your tent. If you got to push people aside, push people aside. Because all you got to do is get within eyesight of that serpent on that pole. You got to lift it up, Moses. You got to lift it up, Moses. Because if they can just look on the serpent, something's going to happen in their body. I might not be able to explain it, but something is going to happen when something's lifted up in front of them. Let me just tell you something. If you've got problems, if you've got to crawl to the cross, I wouldn't let anything keep you from the cross today. I'm not preaching some magic hocus pocus today. But if that cross and what happened on that cross is as real as we think it is, whatever I got to do, I got to get to that cross. Whatever I got to do, I got to get my need to that cross. I got to get to the cross. I got to cling to the cross. I got to look at the cross. Moses, lift it up. So we get into John chapter 3. BJ, can we put this on the screen? John chapter 3, and and Jesus is ministering and talking. (laughs) And here's what he said, verse 14. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. That's why Jesus earlier in the gospel said this, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. Now, honey, let me just preach to you for just a second. 
For years, I have preached from that passage, and I've heard preachers preach from that passage, and we've sung songs from that passage. If I be lifted up from the earth, I'll draw all men unto me. And we think sometimes that means lifting him up in worship. I've done this before. I've stood in front of congregations that said, come on, church, let's lift up Jesus. Let's lift up Jesus in worship. And the word says if we lift him up in worship, he'll draw all men unto me. Now, you can apply it like that, but that's not the context. Jesus says, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. Hear me. We don't have to do that today. It's already been done. You say, are you saying we don't have to worship him? No, no, I'm not talking about that. But my worship doesn't lift him up. He's already been lifted up on that tree. He's already been lifted up on that cross. He's already been put between earth and heaven. If I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. The Son of Man must be lifted up. Why is the cross powerful? The cross is powerful because that one day satisfied the penalty of sin. Come on, I want to say it again. My sin might be great, but his sacrifice is greater. It's greater than any sickness. It's greater than any addiction. It's greater than any power that controls us. Everybody shout amen. The cross of Christ, it also today frames my understanding of discipleship because the cross speaks not of self-preservation but self-denial. It speaks of investing not just simply in myself but in other people. It's why Jesus said in Mark chapter 8 and verse 34, whosoever will come after me, let him deny Himself and take up his cross and follow me. You see, the cross, though historical, has to become personal. The cross has to become personal. It's why when you go and study the tabernacle in the Old Testament, what we will find is this the first piece of furniture. In that tabernacle when you walked past the outer court into the inner court was the altar of sacrifice. Because if you and I are going to ever become like the Lord, we will not become like the Lord in a shout. We will become like the Lord at an altar. We are never closer to the Lord than when we build an altar and say, Lord, I lay my life on the altar today. Because we personify his great sacrifice on the cross. It is the cross that frames for me what discipleship is all about. I want to be like the Lord. I've said that many times. Have you heard people say that? I want to be like the Lord. Well, if I really want to be like the Lord, it's a whole lot less of me. And a whole lot more of him. I want you to stand with me if you would, please. It's the cross of Jesus Christ. I want to ask you a simple question. What is it today that if you had the opportunity... If Jesus was here in the flesh, and Brother Blackman, he was hanging on the cross here today. All we have is a a replica of that. But if Jesus was here hanging on the cross, and the offer was made, whatever you need to leave at the cross, he can take it. Whatever weakness, whatever problem, whatever sickness... Whatever depression, whatever habit it is, you can bring it to the cross and you can leave it there. 
And if you knew that in leaving it there, what happened on that cross would be powerful enough to take care of that problem. Let me ask you a question. What would you bring to the cross today if Jesus was here? Well, pastor, he's not here in physical form. But I've come to declare to somebody that that price has been paid. I'm going to admit to you. It is always difficult for me to preach on the cross. And it's not because I'm up here feeling guilty because I feel free because of the cross. But when I look at my righteousness in light of what he did on that cross, I feel so unworthy. That's why the writer said, I'm going to cling to the old rugged cross. I remember an elder, James Lumpkin Sr., it's amazing how you remember prayers. That elder would lift up his voice from time to time. Went to be with the Lord years ago, but he'd lift up his voice and say, God, wash our eyes with tears from time to time and keep us near the foot of the cross. Don't let us stray from the cross too far. You have today. I believe you were given a little piece of paper. If you have that, would you grab that? And ushers, I just want you to look around and see maybe if you don't have one of those pieces of paper, would you just slip your hand up? Just hold your hand up if you didn't get a piece of paper, and our ushers will get you one real quick. I'm not trying to do something cheesy today. I'm not trying to play on emotions today. I'm just trying to simply say to this congregation you can leave it at the cross you don't have to carry it around another week you can place it at the cross what is that thing if Jesus was here if he was here in flesh and we had the opportunity to write it down what would it be I'm going to give you about a minute right now some of you as soon as I said that Something popped in your brain. Would you just write it on that piece of paper? No one's going to collect these. No one's going to investigate what you write. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Oh, Jesus paid it all.
Come on, sing that again. He paid every price. Oh, Jesus paid it all. Oh, to Him I owe. Oh, sin had left a crimson trace. He washed me white as snow. And when before the throne I stand in Him. Jesus died my soul to save, my lips shall still repeat, oh, gee, Jesus paid it all, oh, all to him I owe, I know sin had left a crimson stain. Come on, that, that Jesus is here to help us right now. Oh, Jesus paid it all. Yes, he did all. All to him I owe. Oh, sin, sin had left a crimson stain. He washed. Sing that verse, when before the throne and when. I stand in Him complete. Jesus died my soul to save. Aren't you glad for that? Woo. Come on, lift your voice and sing it down. Jesus paid it all. Leave it at the cross this morning. Let's leave it at the cross this morning. Let's leave it at the cross this morning. Oh yes, Jesus paid it all. Oh, all to Him. I'm leaving it at the altar this morning. I'm not going to carry it with me any longer. Oh, Jesus, he paid it all. Hallelujah. Oh, he's strong enough. He's powerful enough. Oh, he washed. Hallelujah. Come on, that's it. Sing it again. Pray it out to the Lord. Pray it out to the Lord today. Oh, to Him I owe. Yes. He washed it white. Oh, yes. Jesus paid it all. Why don't we all gather around the front of this church? Come on, let's gather around the front and pray together. Before we leave.